Welcome to Dance Mogul TV. We are here live with Gwendolyn Samuel. Miss Samuel, please introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, first, good evening, and thank you very much for having me on your show this evening. I'm very proud of a very positive magazine um, that encourages and uplifts our communities of today. So I appreciate that, and you can call me Gwen. Thank you. Uh, with that said, um, my name is Gwen Samuel. I'm a parent. First and foremost, I am a proud parent, and I also am the founder of the Connecticut Parents Union, which works with parents um, across the state and country to help them fight for the educational rights of their children, because in this country, we don't educate all children equally, period. And that is why I work with parents to ensure that their children, regardless of their zip code, the color of their skin, or whatever their socioeconomic status is, that their child is getting access to the supports and educational services they need to ensure that their children succeed. My bottom line is, uh, whether it's a politician or lawmaker or an educator, I don't negotiate the well-being of children at all. And we as a country, we as a community, need to go back to the roots, if you will, because as a village, we used to raise the child. We used to ensure uh, that the, ch the child was successful in school and in the community. And society is teaching us that that's the value of village is not that important. Um, and we can see where that's leading. Our children are, are in schools that are unsafe. They're in schools that are not meeting the educational needs. Our black male is um, on the most wanted list from the time they come out of the womb. And that's not okay. So I work with families and communities to ensure that we're protecting the educational rights of all children. Now, you've used the word, thanks for that, by the way. You've used the word fight. Um, part of what, as taxpayers, um, we pay our taxes to help contribute to the educational um, system of this country. And so when you use the word fight for free and fair educational um, systems slash processes, how does the word fight come into, into play as far as you trying to make sure that that opportunity is there? Because uh, most states' constitutions across the country say that children are entitled to a free and appropriate education. But let's be very sure here, education is not free. Taxpayers, whether you're a property owner, um, whether you visit a casino and you pay taxes, if you're in your state and you're paying taxes, you're paying for the public school. The challenge with that is it chooses who it wants to educate, and depending on your zip code. And so we create these pockets of poverty or these housing patterns that keep certain classes of people over here, and unless you make a certain income, you can live over there, and then that will determine, uh, for the most part, the quality of instruction. So I always say to taxpayers, people say, well, I don't have children in the, ta in the school system, so, but you pay for them. So how about working um, with the communities that are impoverished and majority community of color to help them improve the school system in their neighborhood? so that we all can have um, equal access to great schools. You're paying for them. Yes. So we might as well work together to improve them. Now, are you, do you, are you, do you work with individuals or, or do you work with cities or how do you go about pursuing um, helping to provide equal access? So when we started the Connecticut Parents Union, we started the Parents Union because in 2010, we had introduced a law. We heard about a law in California called the Parent Trigger, which is just a parent empowerment law. It was a law that helped give parents the educational rights to improve a school that their child attends if it's low performing, meaning it hasn't met um, good progress in reading and in math. So I thought, you know, because a lot of people in the status quo people that are status quo or, or people from other communities, they think parents that are of color don't care about their children. 
So I thought everybody would welcome this law. So I heard about it in California. I said, I'm going to introduce this law in uh, Connecticut so parents can be more part of the educational process to improve schools. Little did I know the state would go crazy. So I got lawmakers to introduce the law that parents are going to be a part of the decision-making process. And then the teachers' unions, everyone came after us like we had just robbed somebody. And I couldn't figure that out. Why is it that you don't want parents a part of the educational process? They're not your children. They're other people's children in those schools. So why wouldn't a teacher or an educator want to partner or a lawmaker would want to partner with a parent? So when I realized that in Connecticut, the wealthiest state in the nation, so I want you to be very clear, we have more money than other states in this whole country, yet we have the worst achievement gap in the nation between children of color and their counterparts and the non-minority population. So that doesn't make sense to have that kind of wealth and also have that kind of poverty. So when I introduced the law, we end up getting a, a, a weaker version of the law. The unions really came after us. And I just didn't understand how teachers' unions had so much power over a system that's supposed to be partial, supposed to protect all of its citizens, children included. So I founded the Connecticut Parents Union. And once we launched, uh, we were very aggressive. I mean, very straightforward. All children deserve a chance at a great education. And I won't negotiate that. So parents started to reach out to us. We started getting phone calls. We got kind of bigger than our bridges, uh, and as they say, because we had more of a need uh, than we actually had resources for. Because most of this fight would need to be had in a courthouse. Because the failing of our children has become the norm. Yes. And so they violate all kinds of civil rights acts and the 14th Amendment and their own constitution because we, and this is where the community comes in, we have allowed systems to do that for our cho- to our children. And so now only we can undo what we've allowed people to do. Yes. And so we founded the Connecticut Parents Union. We get calls uh, from literally across the country. And so our goal again is to ensure that parents are protecting their children because if we don't protect them who will the system tells us whatever letter they send in the mail that's where you send your child to if they tell you to go a you're supposed to go a if they tell you to do b you're supposed to do b the question becomes what happens if a or b is not good for your baby what are you supposed to do are you going to continue to put your child in harm's way when you know the school cannot meet the child's needs, or are you going to fight? And it is a fight. Wow. Every day I wake up, there's a call. Every day I hear, so, man, this is what's happening. They're violating my child, right? Or they don't have the proper support service. Or children that speak Spanish don't have Spanish support. Yet we spend billions of dollars. But that's just not okay anymore. Just the country can't sustain that level of low performance. So we're working to do our part. I'm just doing my part, uh, as they say, to make the world better. And uh, I'm following the footsteps clearly of Malcolm <laughs> and Martin. They say, oh, you must be reacting like Malcolm and Martin. I says, no, they're Malcolm <laughs> and he was Martin. I'm just doing my part. They pass the baton over to the next generation. I am the next generation. And then I must teach my children and the children in my community to be advocates for themselves because who's going to do it better than you? You're absolutely right. And, and, and speaking of your part, I wanted to interject because I think it's important for our young people to understand more about the type of person that you are so that they can better understand why and how you're fighting the good fight to make life better for them now and in the future. So with that in mind, I wanted to ask you, I see from your bio, it says that you're a graduate of Springfield College with a bachelor's of science in in human services. What is it about you that you noticed early on in life 
that made you start to care about others and what got you on the path of wanting to help people? The reason why I'm asking that question is because there's going to be a lot of young people that are going to be listening to this interview. And I want them to hear firsthand from someone that is on the front line fighting for them, the type of person that you are so that maybe if they can identify with you as they get older, they can identify with you in a sense that maybe they can too also fight the good fight one day. Absolutely. So I'm going to speak to both the young people and the parents or the guardians or the siblings of the young people. Because young people look to the adults and those around them as role models and support services. So it's important that young people understand every decision they make in life has a consequence. And so, yes, I have a great education. I was a high school graduate. But I'm also a young woman that was looking for something. So as they say, some say looking for love in all the wrong places. And so I didn't um, go right from high school. I went to college. I went one year to college. And then I ended up having children in my late 20s. And then I had another set of children in my late 30s. And I'm like, okay, what am I showing my children? What am I, um, what legacy am I going to leave for my children? Because growing up, I just did what everyone told me to do. Because that's what society teaches you. But then I started to notice that we don't treat all people equally. And then I started to understand my history as a black person. And I'm saying, why are we accepting some of the things that are being told to us? So I did a lot of uh, soul searching and started to volunteer a lot in the community. And I didn't get my bachelor's degree until I was 39. I went back to school at 36, got my bachelor's at 39. So for the parents, it's important to know it's never too late to go back to school. And for our young people, it's important that um, you dream. You dream about what maybe you want to be when you grow up or as you're growing up. You know, gravitate to those that are going forward so that they can help propel you forward. And I kind of didn't have that coming up. So I was like this flower. I was in the middle of this field, right, just being tossed to and fro. And then as I started to meet with other positive people, um, it started to help shape me and mold me. So it's important to know that we're not in this world alone and that um, we must work together. And it's through that that I was able to lift myself up as the bootstraps, as the president said. Yes. Uh, go back to school, um, started to work more in the community, and realized I just had the natural gift of working with people. Yes. And so as I started to work with people, I started to see more and more of injustices, and then I saw about Martin Luther King's quote, who said, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. So that means if something is happening to one person, we all should be affected by it. And then that was the heart I realized I had, so I wanted to make a difference. And then I went back to school, got my bachelor's, started to volunteer in the community, started to work more with the youth and their families to help build stronger communities. Because we automatically assume because someone's an adult, you know, they're in their 30s and 40s, they should know better. Some people grow up later in life, but uh, we have parents that drop out of you know school early or had a bad experience, so we have a lot of parents that haven't graduated high school, and then if they're not thinking about education, sometimes it's hard for them to encourage education in their home. So that's why it's important that the village works together to support not just the young child, but support the unit that's going to support that child, because the child can't make decisions on his or her own when they're young. They don't vote, they don't sign medical release forms, they're trusting the adult in their life to make a decision. So what I will say to young people is, it sounds like parents are, you know, really getting out of the pond that you can't hang with this person or you can't hang with that person. It's not that we're judging your friends. Sometimes we're looking at our life experiences when we were young and some of the um, hard knocks that we had to face and we tried to, prevent you from having to go down some of those paths. 
So that's what I would say to young people. I hope I was clear. Yes, you was clear, and that was great. And you used the word the village and, and working and coming together. And I just wanted to, um, to, to go into a little bit more details about that. As far as the work that you do, you laid out as far as what young people can do to, to, to help as far as being focused and, you know, working closer with their parents. Talking to the talking to the parents, how can the parents work with you to help provide a better and equal education? What can the parents do across the country? Because you go across the country and you work with different parents. What can they do as far as mobilizing and getting involved with what you do to help the process along? As parents, we have to realize at the point that we had children, or we, whether we got custody of children or we gave birth to children, that we are responsible for our children's well-being. And so, some, you know, we hear sometimes when they say, "Oh, parents, you know, are the children's friends," and people might disagree on that. I am my child's mother. My job is to provide a safe environment. Um, a nurturing environment that will help them grow. Will that come with life challenges? Absolutely. But it's important that we tend, we come together as parents and community leaders to say we must support the well-being of children. Children are the most vulnerable, other than our senior citizens and those with disabilities. And so how can parents join forces with me is number one. I want to join forces with them because we have to make sure that our children get a fair chance at life. I didn't say life was fair. I just said our children deserve a fair chance at it. And they must get to know their child. And in doing so, because we have so many low-performing schools in the country, I am, I am really, really working with parents to say we must get to know our children's reading levels. We keep saying, oh, schools need to improve reading. Oh, give a child a book. And yet we have kids graduating from high school functioning illiterate. And that has a cost to the parent, to that child. It's not fair to that child that we promoted that child, gave him a false, him or her a false reality. So, and then when they wake up and they go out and they graduate, get the diploma, they can't even read the diploma, let alone an application. So we as parents must really work together to ensure that at a minimum, which is a maximum for me, that we are ensuring that our children are getting the reading resupports support that they need. And how I was able to see, succeed to go back to school at the age of 36 was the fact that I had a strong reading base. So when I went back to college, I didn't struggle as much because I had a good foundation of literacy. I was able to read the application 30 years later. Okay. But we have kids who are out of school one year and couldn't get an application the next year later, let alone 30 years. 30 years. So again, we must work together to ensure that we're supporting our young people. Does it mean our lives are over as parents? Absolutely not. But at the point that we, pick, you know, we have um, the responsibility of raising children, uh, we must put the needs of our children first to ensure they succeed, but also make sure we're taking care of ourselves physically, healthy, and mentally. So what I'm saying to parents is first and foremost, make sure that we know the reading levels of our children why they're trying to improve some of these low performing schools throughout the country. Thanks so much for that. And I wanted to, um, as we go into um, to close, I wanted to hear from you if you had the ability to influence policy in this country on a high level, what would your suggestions be to help create the environment for equal and fair education to all throughout the country, from the urban communities all the way up to the suburbs? So when we think of power, we always think of power, you know, politicians and those who are making the decisions. But they're in office because we voted for them. We came together in number to put us, him or her into office. So even before I got to the lawmaker, it's important that we help communities understand their power and that they have the power to put someone in office. And they definitely have the power to remove someone from office. And I don't think as a, as a community we have begun to own that power. 
we owned it back uh, over 50 years ago when we were fighting for the civil rights, but we got kind of complacent um, in our actions. So the first thing I would want communities to know that we do collectively have the power to put people in office and also to remove them. With that being said, if I had the year of Congress, and I've had testified before Congress, but everyone comes to the table with their own agenda, we must be very clear when we're before lawmakers that under no circumstance will we ever negotiate the well-being of our children. And the same thing that you want as a lawmaker for your children and your family and your loved ones and your nieces and nephews is the same thing that we want for our loved ones, our children, our loved ones, our nieces and nephews. So I would encourage lawmakers to work with us, not just uh, for the camera. If you're going to kiss my baby before November, if you want my vote on the forehead, make sure you're speaking to me after I pull the lever and vote for you in November. We have to do a better job of holding lawmakers accountable to their position. And the only way we can do that is by creating a collectiveness of voice and a collectiveness of action. What we do do well as a community of color is we come together, we do kumbaya, we hold hands, we cry, oh, it's tragedy, and then we go back to business as usual. But if you look at the tragedy, like what occurred in Newtown, when it was a horrific shooting, and it, and it took the lives of 26 of 20 children in a suburban community. But in our community, we see death and dying every day. And we didn't see the country galvanized like that for our children. So we must ensure that lawmakers are treating all of us equally. And that's by demanding it. That's by holding them accountable. But before we can even get there, we have to become a collective body that won't move if they don't do right by our children. And right now, you know, they promise us a little mule and some land. And we... And we're scared till we got our meal, we got our land, and we're happy. But our kids are suffering, and so we must do a better job. Wow, Glenn, Gwendolyn, and I really appreciate um, what you've shared with us today. You've helped us to see that we need to accept personal responsibility as individuals. Um, you helped us to see that. As parents, we need to make sure that we have our children's best interests and we need to get involved and stay involved in our children's lives from an educational point of view and also from a community point of view. You also helped us to see the importance of understanding the power that we can have if we come together as a community as far as holding our lawmakers accountable. And I feel that all of those subjects are so important and you know this interview is just so empowering in all of the information that you've shared with us can you tell us how individuals can get in touch with you if they want to get more information about what you're doing um, so if you would like to reach out to me um, i'm on facebook it's uh, gwen samuel on facebook you can also uh, see uh, the connecticut parents union on twitter at CT Parents Union. So again, on Twitter, we're at CT Parents Union. And on Facebook, you can reach out to Gwen Samuel. And if you have any questions or comments, you can also reach me at uh, 203-443-3203. And we work with parents, again, uh, through the state of Connecticut, but across the country, because we all should have one mission, is to ensure that our children have the best access great educational option. That's, that's so true. A uh, Part of what we like to do um, as we close our interviews, we always want the younger generation to know that it's so important to, um, to give thanks to those that helped us along our way as far as helping to, to build us up. And so at this time in the interview, you can give thanks to anyone that you would like. So at this time, definitely I uh, would like to, without well, my mother and father, I wouldn't even be here. First giving honor to God, of course. But, um, and Yusuf Salam, he has been a great, he's now my publicist. And he has really um, exposed me to the information that I need uh, to support. I have a black man, I have three blacks, I have three males, three black boys, and a daughter. And just having, um, 
leaders like Yusuf and Dr. C. Perry and individuals like you who run a magazine, uh, a clean cut magazine that could be put in schools, role models and individuals like you is what is going to be the game changers in uh, things that oppress our children. So I do thank you as well as those around me for giving me this opportunity. And I look forward to seeing the dance. Is it called the Dance Mogul? Yes, Dance Mogul Magazine. I look forward to seeing it in all the schools across the country because it's positive, clean cut, it uplifts. And um, our young people need to see more of that in magazines uh, that come across the desk of our children. So I also like to thank you. And I look forward to having my own copy in Connecticut. Yes, um, we'll make sure and get that out to you. Um, Gwendolyn Samuel, thank you so much for taking your time, for sharing your passion with us and helping us to understand how you're out there on the front line fighting for our youth and the importance of us coming together as a community and always being mindful that we need to always fight for what's right if we expect to unite in any kind of way. So again, thank you and you're welcome to come back on our show at any time. I look forward to it, and again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you.